closer to the mic. Happy Sabbath again, everyone. Happy All right. This is our little, um, yes, <laughs> the group uh, that we just, you know, came together and we just try to practice this song to give praises and glory to God. Amen. Amen. All right. So just listen carefully as we, as um, God bless our voices as we sing this song. Amen. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my father's throne. Make all my wants and wishes known in seasons of distress and grief. My soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempest by thy return, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, thy wings shall my petition bear to him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless and since he bids me seek his face believe his words and trust his grace I'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer may I thy consolation share Till from Mount Pisgah's lofty height I take my home and take my flight In my immortal flesh I rise to seek the everlasting Shout while passing through the air. Farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. And shout while passing through the air. Farewell, farewell, sweet.
Can you turn that? Oh, there it is. Was that a blessing or what? Amen. I think we should demand an encore. Amen. Never practice just one song together. You have to have an encore. That was beautiful. Uh oh. This would be a good time to tell everybody to turn their phone off. There we go. Amen. Everybody still here? We're still together? Still on the same page? Heaven bound? Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, it is still a privilege to be in the house of God. And Lord, we are just thankful. We're thankful for everything that has gone on today on this Sabbath, from Sabbath school to the main worship, to our fellowship, to the afternoon, to the AY with all the children. Lord, what a blessing to have all those children here today. It's a lot of work, Heavenly Father, but what a blessing it is. And Lord, now as we are, are getting ready to close the Sabbath, Lord, as we continue with our, our study of the heart, the physical heart and the spiritual heart, and how it needs to produce a, a revival and a reformation in us, we ask for your Holy Spirit. We ask for guidance. We ask that the Holy Spirit would give us ears to hear and eyes to see, Lord, as you open up these, these Bible verses and the spirit of prophecy and and things that happen in the natural world and how we can apply it into our own lives. And Lord, again, I just, I lay my pride, my, my selfishness and fears, I lay them at your feet, Lord. And I, I, I pray, Lord, I pray that you would speak to me and through me now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All righty. We're going to do just a little bit of a review just to make sure we're still back where we should be. We studied this morning that in order to really get an understanding of a revival and a reformation, it helps to study what's in the natural or the physical world because what happens in the physical world happens in the spiritual world. Amen. And uh, it, it's so clearly when you see it and as you start studying and as you're praying, as these things open up in the physical world, God speaks to you through those things that are happening. And that's how it is when he speaks to us through the parables, which is why we should be studying what Jesus says and what Jesus did. His, his teaching, his healing, his ministry complete. And so what did we say this was? An e, yeah, an EKG representing a heartbeat, absolutely. And as in the spiritual world, or as in the natural, so in the spiritual world. And that has been our theme for the entire day. And that's found in 3, Spirit of Prophecy, 418. Oh, i got to stop here. Sorry, got to make one adjustment. I started at the very beginning. And... Uh, Thank you. I had it set in the back, but I didn't have it set here. So I'm going to go back to revival and reformation. So what we did was we were studying the heart today, were we not? Yes. And this is a multi-functional, uh, really when you think about it, it's nothing more than a pump. Yes. It pumps fluid, it, it sucks and then it pumps, it sucks and then it pumps. And how many gallons a day did, uh, did we learn that it pumps? 2,000 gallons a day that this heart pumps on the average for every single one of us, about 30 quarts a day. It truly is an incredible uh, organ. It takes fresh air, it takes the air that's in the lungs, 
absorbs it through the lining, puts it into the blood. That's how we get our, our oxygen, which every cell in our body runs off oxygen. So if that's why when you die, there's no blood flowing through you. That means there's no oxygen flowing through you. And if there's no oxygen flowing through you, the cells start to uh, decompose immediately. So that's why you're, you're, how many minutes do they say you have before you're, you're, you're probably uh, brain dead? Six. About six minutes. You know, you can go several days without water. You can go many days without sleep. You can go many days without food. But without air, you can only go six minutes. And then it, it'll be too late. So um, oxygen is very important to us. It, it keeps us alert. And whatever environment that we are in, remember, if, if you are in the cleaning business and you're using caustic chemicals, even if you're at home, and you know how sometimes you put bowl cleaner in the toilet and then you spray it with some Windex or something and it starts smoking, people have died from that because you are creating a caustic bomb. And because of that, it, um, um, as that vapor comes up, it goes into your lungs, you breathe it into, it's not that it went into your lungs, but it absorbed into your blood and then it got in your blood system and that's what killed you. So we really need to be careful what we put into our lungs. Um, smoking is bad, obviously, but there's also other areas. Um, just living in a congested city with smog and pollution is just as if you were smoking. They say people in China, you, you know how bad it is in China, you can't even see in China, that um, it is like, I don't remember how many they compared it to just living and walking on the streets. It was the same as equivalent to having regular smoking. Uh, that the air, air quality was so bad. So we learned that uh, the natural and the physical heart, if studied, shows us the spiritual condition of our spiritual hearts. And it's just amazing that God had uh, planned it that way to show us that. This is letter 120, 1901. A failure to care for the living machinery. Can you turn this down just, I got a little bit of an echo, please. Just a fuzz. A failure to care for the living machinery is an insult to the creator. What is the living machinery? The body. It, it's us. It's, it's not just our heart, but it, it's our mind. It's our brain. It's, it, it's you know, we, we, we protect ourselves when we go out in the sun. We do things that we have to do so that, we, that natural forces don't get us. Uh, a failure to care for the living machinery is an insult to the creator. There are divinely appointed rules which, if observed, will keep human beings from disease and premature death. Go to Exodus 15:26. Can we live in this world? I have two questions. Can we live sin-free? Do you think we can live disease-free? No, we always say it about sin. Well, yeah, we can, we can live sinless, but you know, we're struggling with personal sin. But we can achieve sinless. We have to because those, the 144,000, they, what character do they have? They have a spotless character and they follow Jesus wherever, wherever soever he goes. That is the type of character that we are striving for to have that character. And there is victory over sin. But go to Exodus chapter, and this should be a, a, a very well-known verse for the medical missionaries and for those that aren't medical missionaries. Exodus 15, I don't want to exclude anybody. Verse 26, and said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, diligently, what, diligent, what does diligently mean? Purposefully. If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee. Now, what does none represent? A few or all? All. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they have known, or they have studied through the, um, the mummies that they have from Egypt, that they had the exact same kind of diseases that we have now. They even had cocaine addiction in Egypt. You know, that's amazing. You know, we think, oh, it's just, it's just a, a 70s or 60s and 70s or 80s thing, but they actually had a cocaine addiction in Egypt. So none of these will come upon us.
the living organism is God's property. You know, we, we think we own these bodies, but we don't. It belongs to him by creation and by redemption. And by a misuse of any of our powers, we rob God of the honor due to him. How could we misuse powers? Any ideas? Overworking. To me, overworking comes the first to mind because there's tendencies I, I tend to overwork. I tend to do too much. And it, it breaks me down by the end of the week. I, I'm, by the time I get to the Sabbath, I'm like, ah. and, and it robs me of my blessing for the Sabbath because overworking for the man during the week when we need to pace ourselves, we need to know what our limits are, uh, we need to be practicing uh, water, walking, and the right nutrients we need to be taking into our body. So any misuse of it, of our powers, we rob God of the honor due to him. So what was our theme again? As in the natural, so in the spiritual world. Can we really discern the things that happen in the spiritual world, in the natural world, without the eyesight of the Holy Spirit? No. Spiritual things are what? Spiritually discerned. So we always need the, the help and the aid of the Holy Spirit. We also learned that we are dealing with heart disease. How many people have heart disease? Literally, she raises her hand. How many people have a spiritual heart disease? Every single person in this world. Go to Romans 3, 3 chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, we should know this by heart. Someone asked me earlier if they could become a member of this church. And um, I said, have you sinned? And he looked at me like, I don't know if I want to answer that question. I go, well, have you sinned? And then it, it came to him, well, all have sinned. And I go, well, if you've sinned, you are a member. You can become a member of this church. Because uh, uh, the church is for who? Sinners. We like to think it's for um, those that have no need of a doctor. But it really, it's the worst are supposed to be in the churches. We like to get in the church and we want everybody to be just, oh, perfect. But the church is for sinners. The church is for sinners. What does verse 23 say? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, someday we'll be in a church together where there will be nothing but saints, uh, sinless saints. But uh, until then, this house is a house for sinners. Amen? Colossians, or Colossians, Christ Object Lessons, 160. The nearer we come to Jesus, and the more clearly we discern the purity of his character, the more clearly we shall discern the exceeding sinfulness of sin and the less we shall feel like exalting ourselves. Those, who ha those whom heaven recognizes as holy ones are the last to parade their own goodness. So the closer we come to Jesus, the more clearly we're actually going to see um, his purity and the sin that's in our life. One more from Christ Abic Lessons. In the whole satanic force, there is not power to overcome one soul who in simple trust cast himself on Christ. But we must have a knowledge of ourselves, a knowledge that will result in contrition before we can find pardon and peace. It is only he who knows himself to be a sinner that Christ can save. Do you remember the, uh, the, the, the Pharisee that went in to pray? And when he went in to pray, he raised his hands up. And the publican, the publican was a, which was a tax collector, was over on the other side of the altar and he couldn't even look up to heaven and he was beating his chest because he was in such misery and agony of being in the presence of God and the Pharisee says I'm proud that I'm not like that person over there 
You know, I pay my tithes. I come to church all the time. Look at the clothes that I'm wearing. But the man over there, he couldn't even lift his head towards heaven because why? He knew what kind of person he was. Where? On the outside? Inside. On the inside. And we talked about this this morning. We can, uh, we can put a, a cover on. We can put a face on. Uh, what do you call it? A game face? You know, the, the football players who put their game face on. But we put our church game face on, and everything's fine as long as I have that face painted. And everything's fine as long as I have on my good clothes. And nobody knows that I'm hurting on the inside. And, and maybe, I don't know, is it just me? Because uh, I've done that. Hey, brother, how are you doing today? I, I, somebody's asked me, hey, I'm, I'm great. Happy Sabbath. And then walk away going, man, I wish I would have just told them what's really going on inside of me. Uh, has that happened to anybody, or is that just me? Uh, yeah, I think so. But uh, I should have just said, hey, you got a minute? Let's go in the other room and pray because I need it. So we started dealing with uh, reform, reformation. But no repentance is genuine that does not work reformation. So we can be sorry for our sins. But if we don't stop doing those sins, are we really truly repentant of that sin? Now think about it because I know I'm not the only one, but there's times where it seems like we're always asking for forgiveness for the same thing over and over and over and over. So if I truly have repentance for that sin, then I'm going to do something to make that, that change that reformation, which is a reforming of whatever it, that is affecting me, so that I don't do that again. Go to, uh, go to Hebrews chapter 12. This is actually a quite common um, situation. Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to start with verse, verse 14. Amen? Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now listen to this. Lest there be any fornication or profane person, as Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. You remember when he came in from the field, he was hungry, and, and uh, his brother was there, and he said, Jacob, Jacob, I'm starving. I'm going to die. Have you ever been that hungry where you thought you were going to die if you didn't get something to eat? And he said, I'll sell you my birthright, and, and just give me that. And it was a bowl of lentils. I know I love lentils too, but uh, they're red lentils. But uh, I, I don't know if I would sell my inheritance, my birthright, for a bowl of food. But when you think about it, if we don't get our diets in line with the Lord and we miss going to heaven because of our diet, did we not do the exact same thing that Esau did? It's a sobering thought. And a lot of people don't understand the food issue. And they think that maybe we as Seventh-day Adventists, we, we take it too far. But what was the first temptation over? Food. What was the first temptation to Jesus after he was baptized? It was over food. The devil says, turn these rocks into bread. It is an issue. What happened to Esau? It was food. So it's all through the Bible. It was food. The children of Israel, what was one of their big issues? It was food. They wanted meat. So let's look at this next verse. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So he was crying, and oh, I need my birthright, I need my birthright, but he really hadn't repented of what he had done. He just wanted, he wanted it all. He wanted his cake, and he wanted to eat it too. So what kind of true repentance do we need? Go to Romans. I should have had you kept your finger there. Go to Romans chapter 2. Thank you. Romans chapter 2.
Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Uh, we'll start in verse 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doeth the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the richness of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to what? To repentance. So it's out of God's own goodness that we are even sorry and we even can approach the cross. Because when we do something wrong and the Holy Spirit's working on us, we don't naturally think, oh man, what I did was wrong. We're not convicted because we are just, that was wrong and I should know better than to do that. We are being convicted because it's the Holy Spirit. Like the guy I talked to on the phone this week and when I hung up, it wasn't that... Um, in my own goodness, I knew that I probably had talked to him with an elevated uh, tone in my voice, but it was God working in me. It was his goodness. It was his long suffering with me, telling me that it was me that was wrong, and I had to make the, uh, the amends to that person that I talked to on the phone. So if we do something wrong and, and you start feeling bad, it, it, it's not necessarily uh, it's you, it's God. But if you have asked God to forgive you and you are still being, having these thoughts that, oh man, oh, I gotta pray about that again, that's the devil just trying to keep you locked in that because he wants us to think that God has not forgiven us and he wants to keep us going in that direction. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter seven for a backup verse for this. 2 Corinthians chapter seven. All right, let's look at verse, verse 9. Now I rejoice, 2 Corinthians chapter, where am I at? Chapter 7, verse 9. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So, yes, got the microphone? The one on the far left. Far left. Yeah. Yeah, um, so we, we see two, two different kind of repentance um, with, um, with, with Peter and Judas. Mm -hmm. Judas' good, repentance lead him to kill himself. He wasn't really sorry about what he did, the sin that he did, That's but right. he see all that was happening, you know, and he's sorry about that, but he wasn't sorry about what he did. In opposed to Peter, Peter was sorry and he went away and wept bitterly and asked for forgiveness. So these are two different um, 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 object lessons that we can look into. Yes, um, in absolutely, absolutely. Did somebody else have their hand up? You know, when we, when we get caught, when you're a kid or something, you get caught with your hand in the cookie jar and, and you're in trouble and you feel all bad, are you really sorry that you got, that what you did was wrong or are you just sorry that you got caught? I struggled with that when I first got to prison because I was having all this godly sorrow, but it was like the, the thought that kept going, oh, you're just sorry you got caught. You're not sorry that you really did those things. You're just sorry. You know, that was the devil telling me on one side, no, you're just sorry you got caught. But then God was telling me on the other side, you need to be repentant. You need to turn from what you did to get into here. And that's the route that I chose to take. So just because we are uh, crying as Esau with tears, uh, he's just sorry that he got caught and got kicked out of his, his inheritance. This is from 16 Manuscripts MS. Now this is going just a little bit to it in a different direction. Same thing, but in a different direction, if that makes sense. God calls for a thorough purification and cleansing of households and institutions. So it's talking about all households and institutions. There is need not merely of a revival, but of a reformation. 
So it's, remember, it's revival and reformation, but it's dealing with households, Christian households, and Christian institutions, which at the time we had Christian households, but our institutions were the printing presses, it was the sanitariums, it was the hospitals, and it was our food services that we had. Every church needs to be stirred as never before. Community Hope falls into this category. Every church needs to be stirred as never before. When the light of God has given shines forth through human agencies, a great work will be done. In demonstration of the Spirit and with power will the truth be revealed in clear, distinct lines. But this work must begin in the home. That's a sobering thought because we see in our church right now, especially in our church right now, we say that this church needs revival and reformation, right? Because we see all the, the winds of doctrine, we, we see the heresies that are being done in the churches uh, every Sabbath, Sabbath upon Sabbath, in our institutions, and we know that we need from the top down, we need revival and reformation, right? But she's telling us we need from the bottom out. The home would be the bottom. The home is the base. The home is where revival and reformation starts. It doesn't start in the church. It doesn't start in the general conference. It doesn't start in our health institutes. It doesn't start in our schools. It doesn't start in any other uh, institute that is associated with the Seventh Adventist Church. It starts at home. It starts with the, the mother and the father and the children. If it's a single parent, it starts with that single parent and the children. It starts in the home. Can the church be supportive of, those, of the, the parents and the, church, and the singles that are at home with children? Absolutely. But it starts in the home. It doesn't start here. You can get encouragement from being here. You can get guidance from being here. You can get instructions in all righteousness from here, but the revival and reformation start at home. And do we see that in our, our society now? We see juvenile delinquency is an all-time high. Does it make, would it not make it sound strange that if it wasn't? But it is. And especially after the kids have been in a lockdown for the last year and a half, um, suicide rates have gone up. Uh, just the mental issues have just exploded upon the scene, but it still starts at home. This is taken from a, uh, the Broken Family and Juvenile Delinquency Program. The relationship between broken homes and juvenile delinquency was widely accepted from the 1900s to the 1930s, 32s. So they knew that if there was trouble at home between 1900 and 1932 when they started studying this, they knew that it affected society. They knew that if the home was broken, the child was going to be broken, and then it would affect and run right out into the society. Then the broken home was rejected for a period of time. But in the past 20 years, there has been a revival. Interesting, we're on revival. There has been a revival of interest in the broken home as an important factor in predicting delinquency. This is why we as a church, especially this church, I don't know many other churches in the valley like this church for the simple fact that the children we have outnumber the adults that we have. That's a phenomenon. The church was full today all the way to the back, every seat taken, and it was all children. There was one, two adults up here. There was an adult sitting in the very back. It was all children. All of those children do not come from a, a, a a mother-father nucleus household. So we have issues. This is why this church needs to grab a hold of those children and help every way that they can. Because Denise and I do, have done prison ministries for so many years, and when we go into the prisons and we talk to the inmates and we get to know them, we find out that so many of them that are in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, even into their 50s, they started out in the prison system in juvenile delinquency, locked up in juvie from the age of 9, 10, 11, 12, 15, 16. Then when they turned 18, they rolled right into prison. And their family structure, when we get to know them, their mother's in prison, their father's in prison. Their mother and father are in prison. Their brother's in prison. They come from broken homes. And 
what are the chances that they're going to just follow in the leads of their parents or their brothers and sisters? They end up becoming wards. Brother Aaron? Yeah, um, what you're speaking on is um, uh, on a grand scale. I said before, and I'm going to say it again, the United States was the last empire to be destroyed. And so communism, the aim of communism is to destroy the family structure. Absolutely. And that they have done a wonderful job in yes, doing they that. Yes, yes, they have. And so we as Seven Day Adventists are to repair the breach. And one of the, one of the breaches is the family. That's Restore right. Restore that family circle. And it truly does take a village to raise a child. That's Amen. right. That's right. And, and that's why that's part of our mission of, as Seventh Day Adventists. It's not just the three angels message. It's, it's part of the health message. Is mental health part of the health message? Absolutely it is. And, and helping to rebuild the family structure amongst members, amongst our community, and in, out in the public at large, that's part of our, our commission too. That's part of, of a health ministry also. So it, it, it's really deep. And, and, and what's sad is that Denise and I can both see children in this church and left to go the way that they're going, we already know where they're going. We know where they're going. We have seen it over and over and over again already. They're either going to be in jails, institutions, prisons, or death. That's, that's sobering. And those children God has put into our care. You know, we, we seem to think that the children just come because they just flood the street or flood the, the church. God brought those children here for such a time as this. If we could take one of those kids and turn them around, just one, we don't have to save the world, but if we could just turn one around, uh, do you, do you, what kind of rejoicing in heaven do you think there'd be? Uplifting humanity begins in the home. The restoration, I like that word, restoration. What, have, you ever, have you ever restored a car or a house or a room or, or a piece of furniture? You know, if you've ever done a piece of furniture, you, you sand it all down, you put uh, paint remover on it, or you put uh, uh, some kind of uh, a remover that takes all the varnish off. You sand it out smooth and smooth. You get it just so beautiful looking. Then you put clear varnish on it, and then you put a stain on it. Man, and it's just, it looks like a brand new piece of furniture. That's, that's what restoration is. You take something that's old and you restore it into, its new, into what it was originally. The restoration and uplifting of humanity begins in the home. So if we want to restore this world into the likeness of Christ, it has to start in the home. My home, Kiosha's home, Barbara's home, Sharon's home, on and on and on and on and on. The work of parents underlies every other. Society is composed of families. Now listen to this. This makes total sense. This is from Ministry of Healing, page 349. The work of parents underlies every other. Society. Now what is society? Where we live, right? The, the nation as a whole, this is society. Society is composed of families, Does, is it not? And is what the heads of families make it. Out of the heart are the issues of life. So if you have a bad heart for a nucleus at home, what's going to be coming out of your heart? What's going to be coming out of that family? And the heart of the community and the heart of the church and the heart of the nation is the household. The community, the church, and the nation, this nation, the United States of America, is what happens in the home. Do we need a restoration in this country, starting in the home? Absolutely. The well-being of society, the success of the church, the prosperity of the nation depend upon home influences. That's powerful. That's a powerful quote. If you were to put a thermometer into the, uh, the United States of America, it, it would show that it's got a temperature of about 110. It's sick. It's sick because the home life is broken down. It's been destroyed. And then we have Black Lives Matter come through, and their main objective at the beginning was to disrupt the family nucleus. 
which was between a man and a woman. We have all of these things coming in that are, that are designed to do nothing but tear down the family structure. Brother Duane. Yeah, um, it's very interesting to know one of the ways how, how the family is broken down. We see that God says we should um, not spear the rod and spoil a child. That's right. But we see in society right now, if you ever dare hit your child in certain states, you know, you're going to get, you know, get in trouble with the law. And that right there is the broken down of society. It's you know? disregard to scripture. Definitely so. Yeah. And if you know, if you want to know if a, if a nation is on its way down, morals is the first thing that goes. And then That's the right. nation follow That's suit right. just like that. Yep, just like dominoes. Boom, yes. boom, 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 boom. And yes, and th that great point because we have the state telling us don't, don't spank that child. Just don't do what the Bible says. Set that child over in a corner and give him a little time out. It, what is that teaching that child? It's not teaching the discipline that God knows that we need. You know, if God is dealing with us as he deals with us as children, is he just going to sit you in the corner and say, I would just want you to sit there and be quiet for a little while? Sometimes he has to hit us hard, doesn't he? That's right. Who he loves, he chastises. And he hits us hard. But he hits us hard, why? Because he loves us. And if he didn't, we, would be, we wouldn't be his sons. Microphone. Okay, so um, as we talk about um, spare not the rod and spoil a child, um, there is an issue, the fact that we have so much hatred in our hearts as parents. Um, the method that God intends for us to use, we are not using it. So that's another issue, because if you're going to correct the child, the spirit of prophecy say that we should be correcting with love. And it doesn't matter how you do it. If that correction is not coming yeah. with the love, then it's going nowhere. And that's, that's one of true. the problems. There that's is true. too much yep. hatred in our hearts. So we're yeah. not able to correct with that level yeah. of love. Yeah. And, and those that are in the Christian, Christian realm are the ones that should be following this. Yep. But everybody else, they are, they're, they're running on, on drugs. They're running on alcohol. They're running on, on power. They're running on life. And you're right. They beat their children severely when instead of punishing that child. Yes, so, um, one point. I, I, I hear um, Dwayne Lemon give a testimony about his son. You know, and his son did something really bad. And he take him into the room and said to him, you know why I'm gonna, why I'm gonna beat you right now? I'm gonna spank you right now? And the child says, no. He says, because I love you. <laughs> I yeah. love you so much, I have to spank you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it may seem, you know, contrary, but, you know, yeah. yes. <laughs> but if it's done, as, as Sister Jackie said, with love and in the, the right proportion to what was done, instead of just done out of rage, you know, they said, if you're mad, never discipline your child if you're mad. So you need to calm down first where you can talk to that child and so the child knows exactly why he's being punished. But bottom line, that child still needs to be punished. Still, still needs to be punished. <laughs> a revival and a reformation must take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. Go to John chapter 16. This is Review and Herald, February 25th, 1902. You know, Jesus says, without me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. So, Jesus went back to heaven. Who did Jesus send in his name? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. You know, we, we've said in here a lot, um, all of those that speak, um, that we need to recognize God's presence with us at all times. If, if we were to go about our daily life, our daily routine, at home, um, at work, in the grocery store, on the road, knowing and understanding that Jesus is with us side by side, uh, just like the song we sang uh, today, side by side. But if we know that Jesus is with us at all times, would it not change the, our behavior? Would we not fly off at people maybe the way we do? Would we not be um, 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 maybe lazy, spiritually lazy? 
Would it just change how we are if we know that Jesus' presence is with us all the time? Well, you know that he has given us the Holy Spirit. Are you in, uh, John, did I give you a chapter? 16. 16. Turn back to 14 first. Let's look at verse 17, or verse 16. You know, we always repeat 15. Everybody should know that by heart. If you love me, what? Okay, but let's pray. The ne- let's pray. Let's, uh, let's read the next one, verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. So Jesus right there tells us that the Holy Spirit is another Jesus. Amen? And he's going to be with us forever. Does that mean just part of the time or forever. Look at verse 17. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not neither knoweth him. But ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I've read this a bunch of times but it really didn't sink home until just a a couple weeks ago. It says for he dwelleth with you and is in you. So if we are asking for the Holy Spirit if we have given our hearts to Christ the Holy Spirit is actually inside of us. Does that make sense? How does he get in there? But he is inside of us. We need to remember that. That is how we are to remember how Jesus is by our side constantly because the Holy Spirit is with us and the Holy Spirit is in us. It kind of opens up a whole new realm of thinking. But go to John chapter 16. Nothing can be done without the Holy Spirit. Chapter 16, just a couple pages over, and let's look at verse, starting at verse 7. And this is Jesus talking again. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin. What does reprove mean? It means to convict. And what does convict mean? It's going to tell you when you do something wrong. It's going to convict us when we're wrong. And he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness. And I love that. That, That's like a, a sweet and sour. He's going to reprove us when we do wrong, but he also is going to tell us when we are doing right. We always think that God is just ready to smash us like a bug if we get out of line. But he is going to, by the Holy Spirit, tell us, when we have been doing righteousness in Jesus' name, and of judgment. So what are we doing wrong? Whether we're doing wrong or right, the Holy Spirit is going to convict us. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. So it is the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that will convict us. It is the Holy Spirit that will guide us. It is the Holy Spirit that will that is in us and is living in us and will abide with us forever as the Bible stated in John 14. Now one more, let's go over to Galatians. We talked a little bit about the fruits of the Spirit in Sabbath school this morning. Galatians chapter 5. It was asked in Sabbath school this morning if you could name the fruits of the Spirit Does anybody without looking in the Bible name the fruits of the Spirit? There we go. All right, let's read them. Let's let's check her uh, her memory here. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. These are the fruits. So, are any of us lacking any of this fruit? If we're lacking this fruit, what is the, what is the real issue? Yeah. When it's put in the Bible, the fruit of the Spirit, we need... We need the fruit. The spirit would be the tree, and the fruit would be what it produces. So if we are not producing fruit, there's something wrong with that tree. 
is there anything wrong with the Holy Spirit? No. Then it has to be us. So we need more Holy Spirit, or we need the Holy Spirit if we don't have fruit, fruit being produced. Did you have something? I have a question. So, because we know there are people who don't believe in the Holy Spirit, and it says that the Holy Spirit reproves the world. So those who, to me, that's like um, rejecting the Holy Spirit if you don't believe the Holy Spirit exists. So I'm, I guess I'm just wondering, like, for those people, like, how is the Holy Spirit reproving them? Does that make sense? If they don't believe that there is a Holy Spirit, right. how could they be reproved by the Holy Spirit? Right. Yeah. But is the Holy Spirit not still working on them, trying to draw them to the Father? Yes, because the Father, he's not willing that any should be lost, right? Or any should be perish, or any should perish. So the Holy Spirit is still going out like, like uh, electricity over this entire world. So he's still going to be knocking on their door. But if they don't believe that there's a Holy Spirit, they're not going to attribute any change to the Holy Spirit. Microphone. It was interesting that it said reprove the world yes and you look at our world like this month is pride month and it's just so out there and mm -hmm. it's just so like i'm going to push it on you and i'm going to push it on you and you need to accept it and just reading this verse it's like okay are they ignored because they got to be convicted that I think they are convicted that it's wrong, which is why they get offended. But to hear this verse say, reprove the world. It didn't say the church members, it says the world. And then you look at our world today, it's just see what we see that is going to hell in a, hell, in a handbag. Yeah, 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 yeah. All the way in the back. That's a good point. Um, the Bible says, you know, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preaching to all the world for what? For a witness. witness. You know, um, in, in the text you just read a while ago in John 14, 16, it says, and I will pray the Father and he will send you uh, another. another. You know, Christ was in the flesh, the human flesh. Um, he couldn't be all over because he was no longer a spirit. So in order for everybody to be comforted, he has to send another That's which right. is the holy spirit yeah. you know and you yeah. talk to certain people and they said hey you know what i you know we can do a new study or a study on the word another but it is explicitly saying what he's saying right there yeah absolutely absolutely yeah first john five well we can go there real quick Yeah, verse 8. Uh, actually, uh, let's start at verse... Let's start at verse 4. You know, it's interesting. I just... Uh, the Lord just showed me something here. If you go to verse 3, remember how we were just in John chapter 14? I said, well, let's go up uh, 14, 15. Everybody knows that. If you keep His commandments... If you love me, keep His commandments. And then it proceeds to start talking about the Holy Spirit. Well, look at verse 3. And we're going to start in 4 where it starts to talk about uh, the Holy Spirit and overcoming. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. So, and now we're going to start and go into the Holy Spirit. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. We just read that in John chapter 14. For there are three that bear record in the heaven, the Father, the Word, which is Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And so significant of that when Jesus was on the cross and they put the spear in him. What came out of his side? Water in blood. And you know, go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Amen. 
And let's look at verse 63. John chapter 6, verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. And what's quickeneth mean? To make alive, to revive. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are what? Spirit and they are life. So Jesus' words bring life into the soul. And they are spirit indeed. Power. They're powerful in those words. That's why as we read our Bibles, we can get so God speak to us as we read our Bibles. And, as, and when we are faced with temptation, when I said earlier, if you're faced with whatever your temptation is, find a thus it is written or the Lord said in the Bible and use that when you are tempted. Um, and I'll, I'll just use it for the men. If you're tempted by, by lust with a woman and... and if that temptation is starting to be a little bit overwhelming, you have to say, get behind me, Satan. It is written, thou shalt not commit adultery. That was words that Jesus said, and there's power in those words. We just read that his words are spirit, and they bring life. So we need to remember that, that our only safety is found in the promises of God. Let's see, where were we? So... A revival and a reformation must take place under the administration of the Holy Spirit. We have to have the Holy Spirit. Revival and reformation are two different things. Revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of mind and a heart, a resurrection from spiritual death. Reformation signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas, theories, habits, and practices. And remember we talked about this morning. Thoughts do what? Act, thoughts bring actions. Actions brings habits. Habits bring character. So if you have good thoughts, you're going to have good character. Bad thoughts, you're going to have bad character. Brother Aaron. Now, I don't want to steal your thunder. So, Go ahead. Um, what she is saying here, we don't need another revival. Right? We need reformation. And uh, there, there is a member here today, she was speaking on Reformation. I had a short conversation with her. And she was speaking on how the, the church, even here, we need to ref, make a Reformation in, in, down to our eating, which basically is your presentation today. And so, correct me if I'm wrong, we need more than re, 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 well, what is it? We need more than revival, right? We need to put the Reformation in there as well, right? You need both, and actually, she's going to address oh, it herself. Okay, here. Uh, Brother Dwayne. Yeah, we look back at the church in Revelation, the church of Laodicea. We see that Laodicea was in a lukewarm, a dead state. Yes. You know what I mean? The question: Can we have Reformation? without reviving a dead body. You get not, what I'm saying? Not true reformation. No, you cannot. No. So first, it's a step. First, you have to revive uh, yes. the person That's who right. is dying, as, we, uh, as you point out today, with the, the refibrillator. Re, re, the fibrillator. Fibrillator. Yeah. It revives that person. Yes. It shocks that heart and revives him. Then, based on his practice that we bring about now, the um, reformation. That's right. Based on what he chooses to do. Yeah. So we first need to get that revival, or revive the spiritual, to our, the, the, the spiritual condition. Yeah. You know, then Absolutely. we can be. Um, what she reformed. says is that we don't need just reformation. We don't need just revival. We actually need the both blended together. And she, she gets into saying that here in just a little bit. Reformation. So revival, let me read this again, signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of mind and a heart, a resurrection from spiritual death. That's like someone who's had a heart attack and has died and they get the fibrillator on them and it brings them back to life. Then reformation signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas, theories, habits, and practices. And remember, we're studying the physical heart. So if you had a heart attack, they put the fibrillator on you, they brought you back to life, the doctor tells you, you need to change your diet, you need to start walking, you need to start drinking water. That's what this reorganization is. 
That's the change in ideas, theories, and habits and practices. And as a result of the fibrillator bringing you back to life, then you make these changes, then you can go on in life. But if you don't, if you just keep getting a, a revival and a revival, or you just try to do a reformation and you don't really deal with, with uh, uh, the spiritual aspect of it, you're going to die anyway. Reformation will not bring forth the good fruit of righteousness unless it is connected with the revival of the spirit. So that's the answer right there. So reformation, it won't do anything. It won't bring forth any good fruit. Like I said earlier, there are many non-Christians out there, atheists, that do good things, that know that we need to stop doing this or we need to stop doing that, and so they make those changes. But it doesn't, uh, it, it is of no value unless there is a revival with it, a spiritual revival, an awakening, so to speak, of who our Creator and who our Lord is. And Brother Aaron, uh, this part right here is really what I was talking about. Revival and Reformation are to do their appointed work and in doing this, they must blend. So it takes them both, it takes two. Have you ever made, uh, there, there's a, it's called JB Weld. I don't know if any of you, you probably have never used it, but it, the guys probably have. But it ha comes in two parts. And you have to mix part A with part B. If you put part, it, it's like for putting metal together. If you just took part A and put it on the metal and then stuck it together, it's not gonna, it's gonna break apart. But it takes both. When you put A and B together, mix it all together, put your two pieces of metal that are broken, put it together, let it set up, it, it, it hardens just like steel, and you can go ahead and use it. So that's how it is with revival and reformation. It takes both to accomplish the job. God brings against ministers and church members the heavy charge of spiritual feebleness. He calls for a revival, a reformation. Unless this takes place, those who are weak and lifeless will continue to grow more and more abhorrent to the Lord until he will spew thee out of his mouth. A lifeless body of professed Christians is so worked by the enemy that a most unwholesome, sickly spiritual atmosphere is produced. You know what one of the causes of a heart attack uh, uh, in society is? Inactivity. It's not just the food or their diet, but they don't do any exercise. They, they, they work a job where they just maybe sit at a desk. They go home and then they sit on the couch. Uh, they get in their car in the morning and they drive. They're sitting down and they drive to work. That is their routine. They drive, they sit, they work, they sit. They come home, they sit, they watch TV. They sit, they sit, they sit, and then they lay down and go to bed. And, and what happens? No exercise, no walk, no stimulating the muscles, and next thing you know, then combined with the diet, and then they're probably not drinking the water that they should be drinking. Next thing you know, they have uh, coronary heart disease, angina, and then they have heart attack. Did you have some, Sharon? Microphone? We need you on the microphone. For those that are listening. I was just gonna say, and then we live in a world where people are working from home, so they're not even getting all that, yeah. which is me. <laughs> yeah, and you know the stats for what we've just gone through the last year and a half and all these people working at home, those stats haven't come out and they probably won't come out for a, a couple years down the road. I bet there's going to be a spike in heart attacks. There has to be because all these people that inactivity and now not only are you sitting at home but your refrigerator is, is 20 feet away. When you were at work you maybe had a, some crackers in your drawer or something but now you got your whole stock refrigerator there and so you, you, you back and forth and um, we finally at work, they started bringing everybody back to work. We had a lot of our off front office that uh, was working from home and uh, I hope they're not listening to this, well I hope they are listening to this, but uh, <laughs> I may have already stuck my foot in my mouth. But I've seen a couple of them that they've returned and they had um, ballooned a little bit. I'm in trouble. <laughs> but they have ballooned a little bit. And it is because of the inactivity. So a lifeless body of professed Christians, it's the same thing. We're going to produce a spiritual, sickly spiritual atmosphere. So if you have no activity in your physical life, your body is going to produce a sickly body. 
and, and we see that over and over. Brother Aaron. I just had a comment to make. I was on a, a Zoom call last night. It was a health, it was a health call. And um, uh, it, they had some nurses in there. Some, uh, I think it was a doctor that's leading out. And I noticed that they were discussing the things about CBD and what, they, what this CBD thing has been brought into the church. And so we discussed that a little bit and I got into the chemistry of it. And what we found was this, the world comes into church, people listen to the world and they tell other events about it. And I'm like, this is not God's word. And, and, the, and the, word, the guy that was leading out, he says, absolutely. Get back to the health message. That's right. Bottom line. That's right. And I said, and I was telling another person this past week, I said, you do eat more when you're at home. Absolutely. I know I do. Yep. <laughs> yep. And that's why I was like, I have to keep a schedule, keep busy and stuff when you're at home. Yep. Absolutely. Because you're going to just eat yourself out the door. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll be running to the store again. But anyway. Yep. And one just, of the worst things that we can do is eat snack in between meals whether it's just a little bit of chips or some peanuts or it's this or it's that that is one of the worst things we can do to our body is snack in between meals and if you are at home and, and if your bathroom is by the kitchen um, it's a struggle for me i'm at home on a sunday i'm praise god i'm down here all the time because uh you go you go past the office to go past the kitchen to go into the uh, the bathroom it's like mm, something's calling me in there i just know it is but we got to find our strength and just walk on past it and uh, we really need to not try to to munch in between meals so a sickly spiritual atmosphere the lifeless body of professed christians you know what the biggest problem is here though is that these christians they don't realize that they are sickly. We are, are we not the Laodicean church? Are they not blind? Are we not? I mean, I'm not going to say they. Are we not blind, poor, naked, wretched, and miserable? We think we're good. We think that we're good uh, uh, missionary volunteers, uh, medical missionaries, but we really were, were Laodicean. We need to be praying to God, just make me hot. Make me on fire for you. And I, I pray that from time to time. And uh, I, I just pray that it doesn't become a, uh, a, a, a torch light like they did with the Christians uh, back in Rome where they would take the Christians and literally make them into a torch light. But we need to be on fire for the Lord. We need to consistently be on fire for the Lord. The devil's doing everything he can. He, he has a... a a uh, demonic fire extinguisher and every time we are on fire for the Lord he hits us with that demonic fire extinguisher and just puts out that flame that we had that the Lord had just kindled is that not true yeah every time we have a spiritual victory I guarantee the devil is going to knock the carpet right out from underneath you so you need as a Christian when you have those those spiritual victories, don't let yourself get so high. What did Paul say? Lest be where I stand, take heed that you stand, lest you fall. So we need to just maintain an even kill, no matter what's going on. Highs, lows, we need that even kill. And this also reminds me of uh, in 2 Timothy 3, 5, where we, they have a form of godliness, but they are denying the power thereof. This is rather a powerful uh, statement towards us. If the warnings and the reproofs given in the Word of God and in the testimonies which we are reading of His Spirit are not plain enough, what words would be sufficiently plain to bring about a revival and a reformation? We hear the Word of God over and over and over sometimes and it likes to put us to sleep sometime. And really, if we are falling asleep in church, or if we're falling asleep when we're reading, what are we lacking? Holy Spirit. Just one touch from the Holy Spirit. Have you been so down, utterly cast down, and then uh, one ray of hope, one light of hope shine on you? Does it not just pick you up and just 
revive you like there was no end? How did Jesus go for hours and days, all day long and through the night? How did he do that? Did he, did he call down special powers? Did he have that already in him? It was done by the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that he says, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to give you another. We have that same ability to do the acts and the works of Jesus. Didn't he say that the things that he did, we were going to do even more and better? So we need the Holy Spirit. This, seems, the, this afternoon, revival and reformation seems to be uh, centering around the Holy Spirit now. So what words would be no, more sufficiently plain to bring about a revival and a reformation? This is from Councils on Diet, page 35.3. Circumstances cannot work reforms. Do you understand what that means? Just because something happens in your life doesn't mean that you're going to make a reform. It just means that something happened in your life and you just keep on going the way you're, you're going to go. When, when I first went to prison, and you know that I went to prison because of drugs, the first night I was in prison, the very first night I was in prison, I was stressing out. And um, when you go in, it was uh, uh, two long halls, and there's beds on each side, bunk beds in the back. And so the new guys go to the bunk beds in the back, and then as the other guys um, go to the hole, or they get drug out of there, or they get released, then you take a spot in one of the, the regular beds. I'm up in the top bunk, and I look over, and they're shooting dope. And this is in prison. And it's like their circumstance didn't work any reform in them at all. The things that they were doing on the streets that got them into prison in the first place, they were still doing on the streets. And that is exactly what that means. So if circumstances in our life affect us in a way that they don't seem to affect us anymore, and we keep continuing doing the same behavior, the same lifestyle that we had chose before, what's going to reach us? Circumstances cannot work reforms. Christianity proposes a reformation in the heart. What Christ worked within will be worked out under the dictation of a converted intellect. The plan of beginning outside and trying to work inward has always failed and always will fail. That's what we like to do. We like to dress up and we come to church and we like to make that change on the outside. We get rid of our jewelry. We get rid of... Uh, 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 smoking, we get rid of the drinking, we get rid of all these things, but the change starts where? Inside. The change is starting. Go to Matthew chapter 12. The change goes from the inside. Remember, we need to diligently guard our hearts. Why? Because the abundance of the issue or the issues that come out of our mouth or come out of our heart. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Let's look at verse 33. O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So the change starts where? Matthew 12, 34. I'm sorry. I started, did I start with, I, yeah, I didn't start with 33. Sorry. I'll start again. 33. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else, or else make the corrupt tree, or the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Verse 35, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Matthew 12. 33 through 37. So it starts on the inside. It starts right here. And whatever comes out is showing what you have on the inside. So we can change. Uh, I, I've seen Christians that 
uh, I won't name any names, but uh, will come and worship. And you get them into a situation and they are cussing like a sailor. And um, so where does that come from? From the abundance of the heart. Now, I know it's always easy to see somebody else's faults than it is mine. But by your fruit you shall know them. I would think one of the most basic um, changes in a person's life after receiving Christ into the heart by the Holy Spirit is the way that they speak. You don't have to put on new clothes. You don't have to get your hair fixed. You don't have to do this, do that. But it's just simply the way that you speak. And, and, and to know these people for years and to still be cussing but yet still be, uh, it, it's kind of, it, it, leaves me, it leaves me confused. It leaves me confused. God's plan with you is to begin at the very seat of all difficulties, the heart. Did we not just read that? And then from out of the heart will issue the principles of righteousness. The reformation will be outward as well as inward. So if our heart is in good shape, our spiritual heart is in good shape, it has to produce good spiritual fruit. It has to be. It has to. And this is our last slide for tonight. Just before Sabbath. There is a work to be done among the churches of Seventh-day Adventists which have not yet been done. Ministering angels are waiting to see who will take up the work in the right spirit. You may say, wherein must we change? What have we done? It is not only my work to enter in, it is not my work to enter into details. Let all humble themselves before God, asking for grace and wisdom, that they may see wherein they have violated his holy law. Unless his spirit enlightens them, they will never know, even though it is set before them by their brethren. Those who refuse to come into the right relation to God, who will not obey the rules of his government, do not bear his mark. They will never know, even though it is set before them by their brethren. Have you tried to counsel someone before? and counsel them and they don't recognize that what's going on is wrong or they, they just don't recognize it at all. Um, I don't know why that is. I know there's been times where I've been saying something to my wife for years. The exact same thing that somebody else, a, a stranger, comes along and says and she gets it. And I tell her, I've been telling you that for years. Oh, I never heard that. I've been telling you that for years. And then somebody else comes along and they get it. Hmm, it's amazing. But there is a work for it to be done among the churches of Seventh-day Adventist. And it hasn't been done yet. But we have to do it in the right spirit. And I don't know if we would say, where and must we change, or what have we done? I, I would think, Lord, what must I do to be saved? Is what I'd be asking. Well, my brothers and sisters, I pray that um, we would get our hearts, our physical hearts, and our spiritual hearts in order. What, we, what do we need to do to get our physical hearts in order? Exercise. Temperance. Sunshine. Water. Rest. Sunshine. What are the eight? What else? Nutrition. There's one more. What's that? Trust in God. Air. That's it. Air. That's the eight. What do we have to do to get our spiritual heart in order? Huh? Trust in God. That's right. And educate others. Because so remember, we're not just leading people. Uh, we're not just leading ourselves to the kingdom of God. We're actually helping to lead other people to Jesus. 
So if, if and actually, if we follow the, the eight health laws in our own lives to the fullest, it's going to affect our spiritual heart also. It'll affect our bodies, it'll affect our mind, it'll affect our, it'll affect our blood flow it'll, when we obey the eight laws of health, and it cannot do anything but help our spiritual life because we'll be able to discern the voice of God more clearly. And that's really what, what it comes down to because there's so many voices in the world right now that we need to discern the voice of God as He speaks to us through the Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh Lord, I'll be the first to say that I, I, I need not only a revival but reformation in my own life. Lord, I know that I, I need to take the health principles that we preach to people every day and apply them fully into my own life. And Lord, I just pray that uh, uh, what we learn from you today, Lord, that we would take it and apply it into our own lives. And that we wouldn't just uh, uh, forget about it and be like the man who looked at himself in the mirror and then when he turned away and walked away and when we leave tonight, forget what we, who we were and, and what we are and what we even talked about. So I pray that you would keep this, this message the, as in the natural, so is in the spiritual world. That you would keep that alive in our hearts this week, Lord. And Father, as the sun is about to set, we just pray and ask, Lord, that... Uh, we just want to thank you for this Sabbath. We want to thank you for the refreshing that comes from the Sabbath. We want to thank you for the blessing of remembering that today is the Sabbath. And Lord, we just consecrate ourselves to you to start this week out, to be used by you, Lord. And we just simply pray, not our will, but thy will be done. And Lord, as those that might be leaving now, I just ask for traveling mercies. In Jesus' name, amen. We still have a while. Do we still have a little bit?